Good morning, everybody. I think we are now live on Facebook. I can see a nice little red live button in the top left hand corner, so all should be good. Uh, welcome very much to our fourth um, Tech Talk on Tech Week. Um, this is um, talks that have been organised by Creative Folks and as part of the Southeast Creators programme that we're running. I'll tell you a little bit more about Southeast Creators at the end of this talk. But very quickly, I want to move on to introducing Matt. Um, we've got a number of people here in our Zoom meeting who have joined us and who are going to be involved in the Q&A at the end. I do encourage those of you on Facebook to also use the comments section to write comments to us. We'll be following that at the same time and we can feed those questions to Matt at the end when we open up to Q&A. Um, Matt, are you all good? Yeah, good. Excellent. Yes, good. And we can see you. I can't see what people are seeing on Facebook, so I'm going to have to guess that everything's looking smooth and correct. Uh, so, yeah, welcome to Matt. And Matt's going to now take over and tell you much more about what he's been doing um, in the world of technology as, as an artist and also as a tutor at um, East Kent College at The Edge. So welcome to Matt. And I shall turn off my audio and my video so that you can carry on. Hi, so um, I'm Matt Rowe. Um, I'm an artist who's been based in the creative quarter in Folkestone since about 2004. Um, my background's actually in craft and design. And over the years I've been in Folkestone, I've been adapting different techniques and engagement projects to work with people in Folkestone and the narratives that have been unfolding around the regeneration. Um, I think the easiest way to uh, start the talk is actually to give you a presentation on some of the projects that I've been working on. I've been working on quite a few really interesting heritage-based projects, um, especially with Anna, who's, who's here today. Uh, we've been working on, on one in Chatham, but I'm featuring mainly on digital heritage projects that have involved my role at the college um, at EKC, uh, which is Folkson College, where I teach on the Creative Computing course. So what I'll do is I'll go over to a screen share, and um, if somebody can just confirm that it's, uh, it's working, I'll press play and let you watch the video. Exploring how we use. Welcome to my talk. My name is Matt Rowe, and I will be exploring how we use new technologies to help democratize heritage. Um, my digital narrator for this process is called Skull Mayhem. He's a skull design by one of our fantastic illustrators here at the Edge, and he will be taking on the role as your presenter. Um, I'm an artist based in Folkestone. My studio is number 14 Tontine Street and it consists of the B&B project space and my own pottery studio. Um, I've been based in Folkestone since around 2004 um, and my practice is quite wide and varied. Originally I trained in ceramics and glass but in recent years I've begun to do a lot more documentation photographic based works. Um, I've been particularly interested in the documenting and capturing of changing folkloric identity in the town. Um, a number of my projects um, use different skills and disciplines from 3D modelling to costume. Uh, more recently I've begun to use video and digital technologies as a process of capturing and developing new avenues for um, heritage. Um, I do a number of different roles outside of my artistic practice, uh, one of which is lecturing at the college in Folkestone, uh, which is the Edge School of Creative and Business. Um, I've been doing that for a number of years now. I work on the Creative Computing course with my colleague Chris Newth, and um, my specialities look at 3D modelling, uh, 3D mapping, scanning and game development. So one of the things I want to talk to you today about is how digital technologies can be used to democratise heritage, to distribute it to a broader audience, and how digital techniques can be used to capture and illustrate history and heritage in ways that um, traditional media can't. So um, what I'd like to talk to you about here is the corn dolly mask that I produced for John Barleycorn Must Die, an exhibition at the New Brewery Arts Centre in Cyrencester, where we looked at how corn dollies have developed as an effigy and incarnation of John Barleycorn over the years. 
John Barleycorn was the spirit of the field and people generally believed that his spirit lived on in these corn doddies and was replanted back into the fields on Plough Monday every year, which is around January. We produced some documentation with my colleague, friend, Laura Mansfield, um, which helped the general public understand some of the cultural implications of who John Barleycorn is throughout history. This was distributed through publication at the um, exhibition. We also produced a heritage-based beer using Chevalier malt, which has been regrown from um, vintage seed stocks, um, which um, have been brought back from the Edwardian and Victorian period. So uh, we were really looking at how heritage could be activated in arts capacity. And this leads me on to some of the projects that I've been doing recently with various organisations. Um, I've been working with the um, Canterbury Archaeological Trust um, uh, with the Finding Innsworth project, which was a very exciting project where we looked at the identity and relics of St. Innsworth, folks and uh, Anglo-Saxon saint. Um, I used a number of digital processes and technologies on that project to help bring that to life, um, using photometric scanning through to um, traditional video and photography. Um, we've also been working through the college and as an artist in my own right on the Waking the Giant project, which was led by Albin Incorporated at uh, Fort Burgoyne. It was in partnership with Pioneer Places and the Land Trust, and it was surrounding a year of engagement at the site, looking at new ways interpreting the fort and what its history and heritage could be. I'll talk about this in more detail later um, and show you some examples of the digital processes that were utilised. So here you can see my mask of John Barleycorn being developed as a face filter for Instagram. It's using um, AR tracking to map the photograph that I produced of the physical mask that I created for the exhibition. This is now mapped to my face and can be used um, on various social media platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. It's just one way that um, we can merge traditional techniques with new technologies to distribute heritage to a much broader audience. Skull Mayhem is animated by syncing the visuals to an audio track. Using a specialist piece of animation software, the facial expressions and mouth movements are tracked to the audio frequencies. This opens up a number of possibilities to create digital narrators for a number of projects and different themes. Still a boy, better know I get dope 
but I don't pay a crow. Catch me vibing in the party. I'm chilling in Versace or the Ed Hardy. My lyrics invade like the army. So think twice before you get sarky. We speak the sonic. I got another job done. I wrote another song. You man ain't even got one. The Fort Burgoyne project was an external project commissioned by Pioneer People and Places, Albion Incorporated and the Land Trust. The project gave our students a framework for research development of ideas that could be clearly measured and evaluated. The Land Trust were particularly keen to promote the engagement of the site, but faced a number of issues due to its location, access limitations and health and safety considerations. Our students were steered towards the reimagining of what the site could be, considering its previous history and its future use. We were lucky enough to negotiate access to some LiDAR scan data that had been used to see the condition of the structure itself. We managed to use this scan data in a number of creative applications. These range from film and photography to virtual reality escape rooms. Throughout the project, students considered how their creative applications could be used to help promote the future use of the fort. As lecturing staff, we provided a number of roles to help support our learners throughout this project. Primarily, we negotiated access to the site and arranged transportation. And secondly, we helped provide new technologies for them to explore and create interactive experiences These new technologies allowed our learners to interpret their heritage, their way for new audiences. In the previous drone clips, you get a sense of the current state of the site and its location. The clips you're seeing now illustrate some of the creative responses that students have produced using the Unity game engine. They've imported the scan data, retextured and retopographied the landscape and created new narratives on ways of exploring. In this sequence, you see uh, some of our students producing the promotional material for their VR escape room, which featured at the Waking the Giant event, which was the culmination of the year of engagement at Fort Burgoyne. Here's one of our students using a structure sensor, which is a structured light scanning sensor attached to an iPad to sample some of the interior details that weren't available in the LiDAR scan. These were then used to be redrawn and reintroduced into the game itself. Here they are producing more promotional materials for a poster to advertise their game. This is a presentation to the Land Trust who were commissioning the VR escape room. Having a portable virtual reality kit allowed our students to take this on site and gather feedback direct from clients. This also gave them the ability to present their work to the public. We conducted a number of site visits throughout the period of engagement and the final project that was presented um, as part of the Wake in the Giant Vessel was the VR escape room and here you see the development of the game uh, by the student. They're showcasing um, some of the techniques they've developed using virtual reality such as the fragmentable boxes, the interactive elements of the game, such as the axe. They spent a long time learning coding and scripting to make this happen, and considered how some of the archival aspects like this fort map could be used within the game itself. A lot of the um, investment in time of our students was looking at how they could create the right kind of aesthetic, the kind of detail that they needed to put in to make this a convincing game. As a creative media course, we concentrate quite heavily on um, development of ideas, creating an understanding of how to research, 
how to apply that research into developing new original ideas. One of the advantages of the game engine is after the initial investment of the computer, it requires a lot less in resources and materials than a traditional art and design course. The scalability of the engine allows you to duplicate and create quite monumental structures that can be previewed on the computer screen and saved to a hard drive. One of the main benefits of Unity and Unreal as game engines are that they're free to use. Um, our students are able to install the software at home and also use the Unity game engine at college. So after their course, they're able to continue using professional quality software to help develop their careers. As demand for digital content grows, Unity is becoming recognised as a must-have skill set within the digital economy. Uh, in this segment here, we're going to see um, another student's interpretation of the fort. They've actually recreated the fort in Minecraft using an extension asset to help younger children of mainly primary school age um, develop and interpret their own ideas of what the fort should be. So this was a client-facing project which allows the client to potentially host a virtual fort online that can be accessed by school groups who could reinvent it in their own vision. This would be used in the evaluation feedback. Okay, can you all hear me? Yeah, you should be able to hear me. I'm just unmuting myself. Okay. <laughs> so that you I can, hope uh... that all works and you could all see and hear, hear the audio. Um, I suppose the easiest thing to do really is to sort of take questions in any parts that relate to that because it's quite a big discussion surrounding what digital heritage is, how it can be deployed and how it's evolving now. Um, and hopefully that presentation gives people uh, a few examples of ways I've managed to merge some of the engagement strands um, with, with digitising the heritage to, to new audiences. But it's um, there's a lot more I've been working on over the years, but for a short presentation, that's that's a bit of an overview of, of, of some of the techniques. That's great. Um, we can I can see that we've got quite a few people watching us on Facebook. Just to say, um, Jez Giddings from the Edge is on Facebook oh, watching as well, and he wanted to. He's actually said that fifty students from the Edge actually got involved in this project, which is quite yeah. a lot of students. So that's really exciting. Mm, across all the departments as well, so from photography, film, computing, and art and design. So. Um, they really enjoyed being able to go on site. So I think this, this idea of young people accessing heritage has been really, really empowering for them. And um, because of the way we work at The Edge, we're able to kind of provide such tailored, tailored um, teaching to, to make that happen. And, and we had some fantastic results. So, so really impressive stuff. Absolutely. Because um, I mean, I, I actually saw quite a bit because I was in, also involved in the project at, um, at Fort Burgoyne. So I have the, I have the knowledge of, of what the students are doing, but it was incredible to see how they engaged with the site through using this technology and using the, uh, you, you talk about Unity Game Engine, which I um, know nothing myself about. So yeah. tell us a bit more about that and how, how important, because you mentioned how important it is a must have skill now. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of soft skills that we teach um, at the edge that, that are more in tune with my original practice. So design, concept and ideas. Creativity is, is really where my practice has come to computers from. I haven't come from a tech background to creativity. Um, I'm used to working as an artist collaborating with people like Anna or Peter Cox or various other people who are, who are performers or artists in their own right. But in my educational role, the game engine has allowed me to explore lots of multiple avenues. So that could be audio, that could be video, that could be narrative, it could be existing data. So a lot of what we've been doing is taking scan data, which is often collected on site for um, archeological or engineering based reasons. So um, in the case of the fort, the LIDAR scan was actually to create um, an accurate record of the structural survey of the space and it costs a lot of money to do these surveys. We couldn't afford to produce this ourselves. But after that survey is done, it's a semi-redundant object. You know, they don't get used that much. It's, it makes a nice presentation. But we were able to negotiate how we could take that um, and utilize it in a creative and gamify it. So a game engine essentially is a, a, um, 
a piece of software where you can take 3D models and mm -hmm. apply actions and events to them. So you can have physics where um, you can walk into objects and they have a reaction. And you saw that in the virtual reality game where um, those objects had what we call a collider and a rigid body, which gives yeah. it um, gravity and interactability within the game engine. And that allows us to take things like the digital archive at the fort, scale it up either to poster sized pieces on the walls or to hand holdable archival objects. And it effectively allows us to create an interactive archive um, that's playable in a game format, which could be downloaded globally and would greatly improve the access of, of, of those sites that are local to, to Kent, uh, to a global audience. Yeah, great. Um, we've got quite a few participants here on Zoom. If any of, they, of them have questions for you, please do oh, switch yeah. on your audio. If you want to switch on your video, that's entirely up to you, but please do switch on your audio if you like to. You can also type in questions into the chat and I can ask them to Matt if that's preferable. Um, also on Facebook, we've got quite a few people joining us. I just want, to, while people are decide, thinking of their questions on Zoom, I'm going to uh, read out a couple of the comments I've seen mm -hmm. on here. So um, we've got uh, a person, Heather on Facebook was saying how she's um, really interested in this because she works in, um, you know, just, oh, the questions now of course vanished, minimised. Uh, really interesting because she volunteers for the Land Trust at Fort Burgoyne and works as, as well at the Powell Cotton Museum and the Kenwood. Oh, right, okay. So she'd really enjoyed, that was the comment earlier on. Um, and she's now saying it's really interesting to see Fort Burgo to use Fort Burgoyne as a way of engaging young people. And it's really exciting to see their, uh, their responses to the heritage and that, that it's allowing the site to become more accessible. And yeah. Jez Giddings also says that Students often don't have an opportunity to say what they think in their own communities. What impact do you think this has on the students being involved, Matt? Say that again, sorry. That just... So, Jez asks, says students are not often asked to have a say in their own communities. What impact do you think this has on the students involved? I think it has a huge impact. I mean, I, I grew up in, in Hive and folks and around this area and nothing like this existed when I was younger. So as I have kind of developed and move through the creative sphere of folks and if you like i've always been conscious that we should be very inclusive with local young people to create a pathway for them to follow and to actually have authorship because quite often in regeneration and heritage projects um there's a sense of ownership by people that are like local historians and they don't really yeah. necessarily understand the young people and the young people don't necessarily understand them we're very lucky we've got some really dynamic historians like leslie hardy and andrew richardson who, who were involved with the Find Into uh, project, who were really up for pushing new ways of engagement. So I think there is a difference between how heritage was when I was younger and how actually heritage has been treated now. Um, I think engagement is, 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 is being seen as a key part of that and voice yeah. is, is really important. Yeah, and just following on from that, Paul, Paul on Facebook says, my eight-year-old and me love the VR at Fort Burgoyne. So you okay. saw, we saw your footage of the, using the VR that was actually part of the Wake in the Giant event, didn't we? He said it was really effective way of bringing history and heritage to the next generation. Great, and it should be fun, you know. I mean, yeah. I think that, you know, quite often academic texts about heritage can be very dry. And, you know, these spaces are amazing. I mean, they're so emotive. And what I didn't show much of in that piece was, the video work I did at Fort Burgoyne as an artist in my own right, and I collaborated with Montrose Composers Club quite a lot um, to produce yeah. this atmosphere. That's kind of my personal sort of practice, which feeds into my engagement. But everybody who went there was inspired by the place, and everybody kind of got a, a sense of being. It was it was kind of a special special sense of getting there, and 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 and, and feeling like it was your, your chance to explore. And and hopefully the VR game was an extension of that and can form a bit of a blueprint for other heritage spaces that are potentially not safe to visit um, yeah. to become open to the public. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that young people steer and take the lead and that we play a supportive role to help them have voice rather than um, give too much of um, a, 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 an overview of what it should be. Yeah. Um, I can see that in our chat we've had a question which you might be able to see yourself Matt but oh, yeah. I'll read it out anyway so that people on Facebook can see it as, hear it as well. So Matt if you were working on a project and dealing with larger areas e.g East Kent rather than just the Dover Fort if you wanted to create a publicly accessible resource that was map based and showed information about different locations and was publicly available via a website 
such as um, is Google Maps the thing to use or are there other map based resources and technologies that people use in the heritage industry? Um, well, I, there's lots of ways of doing it. I mean, I suppose geocaching is like the, the classic Google Maps based um, way of getting people to visit sites. I mean, my background is really as a creative. So the technical side of that is more of a development question where, where the level we teach at on the creative computing course is, 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 is pre-degree. So we, we, we use degree skills, um, but to actually do something on that scale would be, would be quite a big, a big undertaking. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily have the answer to that here today. Yeah. Um, but there are there are lots of heritage based companies that have got strategies to, to help do that. Quite a lot of people do websites which are like 3D panoramic websites with content um, and that links to, to resources. Um, yeah. That seems to be the most common way forward is, is, is creating 360 degree virtual tours. Sure. Which have hyperlinks to, to websites and content, yeah. whereas the VR is much more um, technology dependent. You need a VR helmet and a VR capable computer, and you can download that, but you wouldn't be able to access it through your web browser. No. Um, has anybody else on the Zoom meeting want to come in with any questions on the audio or type any more in? You're very welcome to ask some more. Um, I saw Anna, Anna popped on her audio a minute ago. There we go. <laughs> hey, Anna. I've done it. Um, yeah, I, I can see how interesting um, the responses of the young people were. I mean, actually, compared to my own ideas, <laughs> like of what of what VR would be like, I, I don't know. I just assumed that um, these heritage um, companies or, these, you know, the heritage organisations would only want a kind of direct copy of how the place looks so that you can walk through it as it is. But what the kids did was they just, you know, blew it up. It was pink, it was, you know, and actually that's so much more interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's their primary language gaming. You know, they, they, they yeah. game at home a lot and they understand the narratives. You know, they've grown up gaming with, you know, AAA graphics, which is like highly realistic graphics. And, and, and they know, these spaces, the, these, the, this, the idea of these spaces and level design and the aesthetics of level design is something that they, that they really understand. So it makes sense for them to take it in and, and to convert it and to manipulate it into being something fun. You know, they, they want to, they want, you know, they enjoy the fantasy element of designing their own level, you know, and it is fun, it is quite interesting, but that content can still sit there. So I think that there is that idea about what's true and what's accurate is sometimes not quite as we see heritage. Yeah, I mean, did you have, um, you know, without sort of going into detail, were were the land trust uh, really up for sort of these new ways of looking at the space or were they expecting things that were a bit more um, of a representation of what sits there, you know, more something more historically accurate? It was quite open. I think um, a lot of the brokerage for that was done by Albion uh, Incorporated, who worked to kind of uh, bring on various other partners, like the Museum of British Folklore, myself, and they kind of set a tone for how that event would unfold. But within the year of engagement, um, I tried to find elements that were accurate to the site. So the the film that I produced, which you might have seen with the... Uh, with a red ghillie suit monster type creature with smoke pouring out of his hands, is actually based on the connections between um, British camouflage development for the Home Guard, which was designed by a guy called Roland Penrose, who was a surrealist painter. And he his muse was Lee Miller. And basically camouflage development is intrinsically linked into surrealist art and has been throughout its whole development. So it was a heritage research piece that, um, looking at how the British Home Guard use camouflage techniques in a site where the British Home Guard would have been based or would have been training around. But the output was creative and slightly more folkloric and a bit mystical, um, which is and way how, more fun. You know, how, did the, how did the audience react to your work as well? Pretty good. I mean, I mean, people, I, I didn't hear too many complaints. People were watching the film. Um, I think people like the spookiness. I, th I think quite often, heritage tends to be sanitized um, and to be made quite plasticky. And I think that people actually quite like dark tourism, if you like, you know, the, the idea of the darker solid ghost tours and 
sort of slightly odd things and odd spaces. Um, I think that that's something that, that you know, the Brit British public have got a fascination with hauntings of spaces and like echoes and cultural memories of what spaces were and what they could be. And I think the game engine and the film certainly allowed that to unfold. And, and the audio that was, was produced was very collaborative. So it had this kind of folk element and it was specifically collaborative in how that, that moved forward. So it was about offering a new voice for that space. You know? So, uh, I mean, this is more of a personal question because um, we we have talked about this in the past, but, you know, when you've made the, your films, for example, um, obvious, the obvious thing to do is just to put them up on your website and kind of forget about them. But how could you incorporate your artworks within a within a digital world that perhaps young per people could explore? It's a good question. I've been looking at it. Uh, so with game development, it's a, it's a bit of a rabbit hole, you know, there's, it, you can do anything in a game engine in, 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 in theory, you can produce lots of things through coded scripting, depending on how good your skills are, but... Um, I thought you said COVID at... scripting then, I'm so obsessed. No, no, not... <laughs> yeah, COVID scripting. No, it's, um, it, you can actually produce like a cinema screen in a game engine that's triggered as you walk up to it and has audio and logic for the game, so you can actually have interactors within that game environment. Um, VR is a bit more complicated because you can get motion sickness if there's not a high enough frame rate. So if, if there's a lot of memory intensive um, activities happening, you can it gets a bit glitchy. Whereas actually tr traditional 2D gaming or like on a computer screen, you can have an adventure or you could build an environment that you can explore, trigger video, walk through audio zones and create a kind of filmic environment. And, and a lot of our students at college are actually really interested in the cinematics of game engine design and some of them are interested in the scripting and coding so as, as, as uh, going back to your original question I think the game engine is, is a really good platform for us to pull together a lot of content but we can export it for a variety of platforms such as PC, Mac, mobile phones depending on the type of um, content we're, we're, we're building. I can so see Sorry, Sorry, it opens up a kind of dem a democratizing of distribution of heritage, um, and the game engine handles that for you. You know, you, you tell it, I want to build for Windows, I want to build for um, Android phone, and um, you know, you, you can you can then sell that or distribute it or give it away or have an event where that all happens. So it, 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 it's it's a bit like um, a bit like how websites were in in the nineties. You know, they they really democratized how you could get your message out. Mm. Okay. Uh, Gabrielle asked a question on the Zoom chat and I've oh, yeah. also got a few questions for you on Facebook as well. So Gabrielle asks, can you use this to create a maintenance record or explain trade techniques? Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, I think one of the big things in VR at the moment is training, you know, medical training um, and industrial applications are huge for virtual reality. And, you know, my, my, my knowledge is, is, is limited to a certain degree. I mean, it's, it's, I've come to this as an artist and I'm learning as I'm going through. The fantastic things about Unity and Unreal as game engines is there's a brilliant forum and technical support there and, and you can use channels like Discord which are a server for solving problems. A lot of it's problem solving and there are companies out there that are using VR specifically for creating maintenance records, creating visualizations, training staff in various locations. Um, if you do a bit of digging around online, um, I think you'll find quite a lot of projects that, that, that are using VR especially for complex engineering um, scenarios. So on Facebook, we've had a quite a few questions coming through. Um, I'm just going to pick them out. They're a bit random in order. So, um, so uh, Steve asks, what interaction can you see between VR and film SFX? <clears throat> as, as this is something we want to pursue at the edge film department. I mean, they're, they're all, the skills are all pretty similar. Um, I mean, we, we, we've got cross-department teaching, I suppose. One, one of our lecturers, Hayes, he works in film and he's working on a creative computing course. Um, you know, a lot of the video software like DaVinci Resolve has uh, like um, 3D software built in. It's, it's becoming more and more integrated. I think the key thing with the game engine is it's a good space to learn how to use 3D particle filters, all these techniques that you need for things like Cinema 4D. So. They are transferable. Um, I think the lighting, the composition, and the language of cinematics is, is a really good place to start with that. Um, so <laughs> setting up 
scenes as a, a proxy <laughs> for a film, you know, before you go out on set and or, or out live to film it, to work through storyboarding, lots of different really positive applications to, to trial things. Yeah. Perhaps making a toolkit for film students to be able to, 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 to learn how to use certain effects like particle explosions, thing, things they might want to put in their, in their, in their finished films. And um, Emma asks, how can young people get involved in these types of projects? It seems very relevant to train young people to be able to create the, these um, virtual environments in the current climate. We can you see need... here um, on my background, uh, <laughs> on the edge. <laughs> it's yeah. the easiest thing to do. Uh, and during, the, during one of our fantastic creative based courses, um, we do diplomas, uh, UAL diplomas in level two and level three. Um, and level three advanced in creative computing, film, media, uh, photography, art and design. Um, yeah. And it's a great place to actually sort of play, you know, to experiment. I mean, we've got fantastic um, cohort of staff uh, at, at the edge, all with international uh, skills. You know, like Steve, who asked the question earlier, I mean, he's been working in film and television for years for the BBC and there, I, th I think I'm right, Steve, you're back to award winning, I, I heard a rumor somewhere. Um, and, you know, we, 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 we're sort of working together a lot to, to, to explore how new technologies can be um, inviting people to, to, to create new ideas. And also we, we really concentrate on off-site projects. We're working a lot with Creative Folkestone. We've been working with Canterbury Archaeological Trust. We, we really like to engage socially outside of the college. So we work professionally in those contexts. And we like to create those platforms for our, our students and learners um, who are of all different ages, actually, um, to, 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 to get involved with, with exploring. Yeah, technologies. I think that because that's something we've talked about before is that you can you don't have to be a young person to get involved in this. And you don't you know, we can all upskill and actually the courses are available to any age, aren't they? Um, yeah. I'm just reading a comment here from Jez, Jez Giddings, who's also from The Edge on Facebook. He's he's written this um, one level three art student art and design student worked on the project and was learning fashion photography. Matt taught her how to shoot on location at the fort using um, off camera flash. She has designed a costume and sourced a model. She then carried out her own photo shoot. She was invited to see a presentation of MA students at Central St. Martins and had a tour of Central St. Martins. This has inspired her so much she's applied to and gained a place at the London School of Fashion Fantastic. to do a fashion and communication degree direct impact of this project on a local young person yeah uh, I think I think that's 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 the proof in the pudding isn't it I mean yeah. working with people and I, I often forget because I do so many different roles in the college and outside of the college you know photography film video I might not be a specialist in every area but that that spectrum of skills is transferable and and we we tend to sort of be able to to inspire students to take their own direction and when they want to go a certain way we we, we can we can support them and that was great. We did this photo shoot up at the up at the fort. It was led by those uh, by, by the students and what they wanted to do. I just play a, like a supportive role, and I, I play a supportive role when I work for other organisations providing digital photography, for example. So I, I see myself as part technician, part part lecturing staff. You know, we we we, we adjust and adapt as need be, really. Yeah. And, and Nick Hughes, who's also from um, East Kent College, has also come on and said and said that uh, Folkestone Junior College is also an option for younger students. So 14 to 16 year olds can go and become um, creative students as well. So that yeah. I, think, I don't know whether that is that a new course or yeah, is that- brand new, yeah. yeah. Nick's, Nick's, Nick's yeah. ahead, he's the, he's, he's the yeah. big man there now. So yeah. uh, Nick's great as well. Nick's got some brilliant skill sets, fantastic prints, you know, yeah. really, really good skills. If you, I mean, for anybody who wants to go down a creative pathway, I mean, the, the college experience at junior college would be fantastic. Brilliant facilities, you know, it's a whole new level of professionalism for, for even younger students to, to kind of get on their career path. But it's well worth considering, I think. I mean, I went straight to art college. I didn't do a sixth form. I, I, went, I went, actually went to Canterbury College, which is one of our sister colleges, um, to, to study art and design. And like many young people in Folkestone, I didn't consider university until I was inspired by my tutors at college who believed in me and said to go. I, I, I didn't have the self-confidence and I think, that's one of the things that you don't always get at secondary school is the confidence to pursue creative courses. And at the edge, we really want to support our students to, to, to go into whatever avenue, you know, work or, or, or university. 
uh, however they want to however they want to go. I think it's interesting as well with you. You you came from a ceramics background, and and you're but you're making films. You're utilizing um, contemporary technologies in your work. I think there's probably quite a few people in the audience, both on Facebook and some of the people on the Zoom meeting who are professional artists who are trying to embrace the new technologies that are available. How, can you, how's that been for you? I mean, has it been a... It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a learning curve, you know, I yeah. mean, it, it's like everything, you know, it's, you bash your head against the wall for a while watching all these tutorials and then slowly it starts to make sense. Um, but like many artists, if you've got an artistic practice, it's the way you are creative that's important. You can be overskilled, and that can overshadow how you're creative. So, what was quite nice was I spent you know seven years studying ceramics and glass, or ceramics mainly. But I got kind of sick of doing potter. I did too much of it. It wasn't. I kind of knew more than. You know, I wanted a new challenge. I think new technologies are really exciting because pottery effectively follows technologies. It's, it's science based. It uses firing, it uses different techniques. You know, the pottery wheel was an invention that came along and revolutionized pottery. You know, the way the microwave kilns have been developed now, there's all these new techniques in, in how we use material science. And digital technologies are, are, aren't that dissimilar. I mean, digital fabrication isn't that dissimilar to making an object. So when I work with primitive shapes or sculpting in a 3D program, my knowledge of clay and ceramics really helps how I'm looking at form and, 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 and tone and texture. And a lot of what we do is we look at aesthetics on the course. You know, how do we make those materials that we're going to apply to objects to make it feel realistic? What is that kind of sensory kind of feel that when you walk in the room, does it feel like you're on a wooden floor? Does it, does it feel spooky? Does it feel happy? So all of these skills that you gain as an artist, which are kind of almost some, sometimes poetic skills um, and atmospheric skills are really, really good for game design. Um, and, and those technologies. And actually a lot of people that come directly from a, a, a coding or computer science background don't necessarily enjoy that side of, of, of the game, game development. Right. They like the scripting and the coding and they like it logical. So I think, you know, there's, there's two sort of camps in, in who's using this computer technology, but certainly Unity and Unreal as game engines are pushing for creatives quite heavily rather than coders now. It seems to be being pushed as a creative tool rather than a scripting program. Have any of the other people um, who are on our Zoom meeting got any other questions? And please do those of you on Facebook fire in any other questions you have for Matt before we wrap up. I'm just waiting to see. Um, Nick Hughes in the meantime has commented that he's actually doing a live Facebook Q&A all about the um, folks in junior college on Friday at three o'clock. I presume that's on the Edge's Facebook page. Is it the Edge or the East Kent College, Matt? Do you know? Um, I think if you go to the Edge Facebook page, it's probably the yep. best place to get the most targeted information. Yeah. So if you've got kids who are age 14 to 16 or will be age 14 to 16 coming up who are interested, then talk to Nick on uh, 3 p.m. on Friday. Yeah, it's definitely worth looking at. I mean, I, I, I suggest to any, anybody who's got children that age is to, to look, at, look at the opportunity because it's a, a really fantastic new, new space. Yeah. Um, anybody got any more questions on the Zoom meeting that they want to bring in? I think we've, uh, I think we've a couple of people, one or two people have had to leave because they've had to go off to other meetings. So thanks for those people for joining us. Um, so it feels like it's probably a natural time to wrap it up at this stage, which is good because we've perfect time in there, Matt. <laughs> Did that well. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to bring on my video so that you're not alone <laughs> while I waffle. <laughs> OK, I think I'm now going to be visible. I can't, I can't see myself, so I just have to assume that I've appeared. Um, so yeah, Nick confirmed that it is the Folkestone College Facebook page. And um, Anthony has actually come on Facebook and asked one more question, so I'll let him go with that. So I think we can spare another minute. Sure, can yeah. you recommend any learning resources to get started with Unity or Unreal Engine? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a guy that we quite often look at for tutorials at college called Brack Keys on YouTube. Mm -hmm. He, I think, has a Patreon page. So he, he spends a lot of time developing really easy and quite kind of clear tutorials for basic Unity projects. But Unity themselves have a fantastic educational package. And due to the lockdown, they're giving away a lot of those educational materials free at the moment. So if you head over to the Unity website and look at their learning section, um, yeah. they've actually got some mini projects to get you started with all the kit and content you need. 
and um, Unity's and Unreal are basically free um, for people who aren't earning a, a big income out of their out of their project. So um, you can get get a free license. Um, okay. So Good. so it, it, cost should not be a problem to to get started in game engines. It's only if you start selling your game for I think over one hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Anna. I can see you've joined us as well. I don't know whether you have any questions. Just trying to join you in solidarity, <laughs> <laughs> not be a black square. <laughs> well done, Matt. I enjoyed that. Yes, thank you. So um, I think that we should probably wrap up the Facebook meeting now. So thank you. We've had lots of people. I just big shout out to all the people who've joined us on Facebook. You've had a really good uh, load of people here. Great. Lots of support here from the edge, I have to say. So that's great. <laughs> hi, hi from. Uh, Jez and Emma and Nick, I'm going to go through the list now and embarrass you all. Uh, and Steve and Chris and Ewan and Paul, Heather, Nick, Nick, uh, Nico, um, who else? There's loads of people. Audrey, hi everybody. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us on Facebook. But just before I sign off, can I say a massive thank you to Matt? That's been fascinating. I could go on for ages and ask you loads more questions, uh, but I'll try not to <laughs> so that we can... Uh, close it up and get on with our other things that we need to do. So to Facebook, goodbye and thank you very much. And to Matt, thank you. And the guys on um, the Zoom meeting will carry on for a minute.